Oh boy, it's turbulent in Washington and it has a trickle down effect here in Rhode Island, of course. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. He's the former minority leader, working for a living, you know. There's a lot of time that our legislators put into their work, well, depending on who they are, of course. But uh, State Representative Brian Newberry, uh, easily reelected and still in the fold with Republicans, a key guy when it comes to, I don't know, mostly common sense analysis as to what's going on in the State House, is my guest tonight. Uh, and we'll get to Brian Toot Sweet. A lot of things going on in Washington that impact Rhode Island politics, and we'll talk about that and a whole bunch of issues that are percolating here at the State House. In the meantime, we go to the rundown, and obviously it's a big news day uh, when it comes to Michael Flynn's resignation. Headlines galore, uh, pretty simply stated, don't you think? The Washington Post had a story that probably ignited this resignation when it published yesterday news about the actual truth of Michael Flynn's conversations with the Russian ambassador. Uh, we record this program in the early afternoon, and so I am sure that you are seeing at 7.30 or at midnight updated reaction from the White House. In fact, just as we were getting to record the program today, uh, Sean Spicer, the press secretary, was getting into this. I'll reflect on his thoughts in just a second, but at press time, here's the latest that we have from CBS. The National Security Advisor. Flynn had been caught on surveillance talking with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. about sanctions against Russia prior to President Trump taking office. In his resignation letter, Flynn wrote, I inadvertently briefed the vice president-elect and others with incomplete information regarding my phone calls with the Russian ambassador. White House counselor Kellyanne Conway told NBC's Today Show that was what cost Flynn his job. In the end, it was misleading the vice president that made the situation unsustainable. The Department of Justice told the White House a month ago that General Flynn hadn't been truthful about the phone calls and warned that could make him vulnerable to blackmail by Moscow. And at that moment, he still had the complete trust of the president? Matt, I'm telling you what the president has said, which is that uh, he's accepted General Flynn's resignation and he wishes him well. On Twitter this morning, President Trump seemed more upset about the leak, saying that was the real story. President Trump immediately named retired three-star Army General Keith Kellogg to be the acting national security advisor until a permanent replacement is named. There are th at least three candidates, very strong candidates, that would be considered for a permanent position here. General Kellogg is one of the three finalists for the full-time position, along with retired Vice Admiral Robert Harwood and former CIA Director David Petraeus. This is a really hard story to follow, and you got as a citizen, you really got to pay attention here. Um, there are all sorts of tentacles to this, but Sean Spicer, the press secretary, earlier today, uh, again at our press time, uh, indicated that Flynn was asked to resign not because he broke the law, but because there was a trust issue between him and the president. You know, uh, we've all seen too many House of Cards episodes to be able to count on that as the operating truth here. Uh, there's a couple of things that are important. The Logan Act has seemingly been broken. Uh, and so has every administration broken the Logan Act, probably in the last four or five administrations. Uh, that prevents citizens like you and me, not appointed or elected, from negotiating on behalf of the nation's security with anybody. Okay? And so that's not what got him. It's probably not the law and the violation of the Logan Act. But there's stuff here that's going to have to be investigated. And I know a lot of you Trump supporters out there will be thinking, well, you know, this is... Democrats' opportunity to seize the moment and call for all sorts of things like impeachment. Well, that'd be getting ahead of ourselves, no doubt. Uh, but there's a problem here with the Russian relationship that's on again, off again. I know Putin. I don't know Putin. I got business there. I don't got business there. I'm not going to release my financial records and taxes. I will. I won't. There's an audit. Uh, all of that is problematic for this president in a big way. That he focuses on leaks is, is almost... Uh, well, it's a description of his lack of understanding about Washington at all. There are people who will leak for patriotic reasons when they think that the nation's security is in jeopardy based on the follies of the White House. And, you know, when you go after the, uh, uh, the phone's ringing, apologize. When you go after, it's almost live television, right, Lex? When, when you go after the intel community, thank you, there's a point, uh, and the attorney general's office, remember, the acting attorney general gets popped because she doesn't believe in the travel ban, you've burnt a lot of relationships. I don't think this is a sour grapes reaction, 
but I do think that we've got a whole bunch of discombobulation that the president actually believes that leaking is his problem. Our relationship with Russia right now is the problem, and the administration's relationship with Russia needs to be investigated. He better get that uh, through his newly elected mind. Uh, we'll have more on this uh, over the course of the week and bring in some expertise on this because this is a fluid conversation, no doubt. All right, and because the Trump administration has created such turbulence on, on so many ways, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, immigration, for instance, we're seeing reports that even Rhode Island is becoming fractured. Now, this is not the first time I've commented on this, but it was interesting to see the front page in the Providence Journal today. Uh, on the bottom, Trump policies divide Rhode Island Democrats. Isn't that fancy, the way we bring that out for you? Uh, this has a lot to do with uh, Jorge Lorza and uh, what he has said about his city. There's no set definition of what sanctuary city is. I have no problem with the term. Some people say we're not, some people say that we are. But what's important are the policies. And Providence has always been a sanctuary for immigrants, and it will continue to be that way. And in nowhere are we going to change our policies. Okay, hey, we're right back there. Uh, do we have Mr. Corvese's B-roll? Do we have a picture of Representative Corvese? He's one of the main players uh, in this discussion. Well, we have a picture of him, of course. That is a longtime rep from North Providence, Providence, Anthony Corvese, who has put in a bunch of legislation trying to, you know, define the uh, uh, policy of the state to really align itself with immigration officials rather than the current tact that we have, which is, hey, we police and immigration officials take care of their business. Um, just one of the things that's, you know, banging around the state house right now, and Brian Newberry is here to help us think this one out. Good to see you. How are you? Good. I didn't invite you in for this. I didn't invite you in for the claim against the, uh, the, the uh, Speaker of the House, which just came across our desk literally as we were about to tape the broadcast today. We'll tell you about that in a little bit. Uh, but since I got you, reflection on that front page story and some of the Democratic divide over immigration policy? Democrats in the state are always divided. I mean, I, I've said for years there's three political parties in Rhode Island. There's the Republican Party, there's the Liberal Democratic Party, and there's the centrist or somewhat sometimes conservative Democratic Party. So this is exactly the kind of issue that's going to split them in half. But it's not new. Uh, we, we, we passed E-Verify my first term in the uh, House. It didn't pass the Senate. Why? Because the Senate didn't want it. The House did. I mean, that's the way it goes. Maybe because the progressive crowd. Do we have a picture of Mr. Ehrenberg? We don't. He was on the show just a couple of days ago and has been on a, a handful of times. Uh, this progressive crowd, as they call them themselves um, across the country, um, really starting to make a little bit more traction in the building. And I think that's why the world is starting to recognize this divide in a more, I don't know, clarified manner? Well, I'm not sure they're making more traction in terms of numbers. I think they picked up a couple numbers. It's more the attitude. Uh, some of the more uh, veteran, pro truly progressive legislators have always worked within the system to try to advocate and get what they want done. They like get what, things the the Yellows of the world? Idiot and... Jello, Art Handy, people like that. People get along well with people and all that. Some of the, the newer people are much more outspoken and aggressive, and we'll see if that's effective or not for them. It's sort of the same contrast we have on our side of the aisle sometimes. but. Um, is it is it outspokenness or belligerence? Uh, well, I work with these folks, so I'll call it outspokenness. You can call it what you want to. But they're aggressive. They're very aggressive, and uh, some of the rhetoric that's been coming out since the Trump election nationwide has been over the top, in my view. I mean, you don't have to like President Trump to see that some of the reaction to him has been completely over the top and ridiculous. I have to agree. I mean, I'm not a Trump guy. I make a lot of Trump, uh, the people perceive me as a... Is, uh, is biased against the president. Well, duh, I didn't vote for him. I was worried about the, the, the nation with him at the helm. I still am. Uh, yet, there is this hyperbolic, um, you know, we, we've got at East Providence High School with the federal delegation the other day, some guy <laughs> screaming for, you know, a unified I, I, new government. And, 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 and I mean, there is, uh, you know, smart people on the way, way left have started to lose their minds. When I see uh, Sheldon Whitehouse and David Cicilline look like they want to strangle their own constituents from the stage, I, I mean, I, I just, I can't imagine what those guys were going through. Because I've had to deal with it sometimes, too, on the other side of the political spectrum. Right. There is a certain percentage of this country that I think that has lost its minds politically, and uh, it doesn't reflect well on them. It's not good for the country, but we'll see how it plays out because it's turning off a lot of people. I know a lot of people are reluctant Trump voters or didn't vote for Trump. They're looking at this circus that's going on saying they either wish they'd voted for Trump or they're glad they did. I'm sure there are. At the same time, there's enough to be concerned about with the president to, uh, to, to hold, uh, I don't know, to, to hold that wish in abeyance. This particular immigration 
uh, divide, though, at the legislature is interesting. You've got dueling conceptual packages. Corvasi, who's definitely a conservative Democrat, no doubt, on social issues for sure, and who, by the way, I wish was more of a sportsman. Uh, you know, hey, Doc, you're welcome to come on in here. And, and talk with us about this stuff. <laughs> Your belligerence for electronic media is old and ridiculous uh, and doesn't help you because I think you're a pretty good thinker on a bunch of things. That's my memo to Doc Corvese. Uh, but he writes a, a piece of legislation that says, hey, we want the cops to be thinking about the immigration status of, of people a little bit more aggressively than we do. Right now, if you are arrested and found to be illegal, uh, there's an ICE turnover, but the city of Providence and the state police aren't looking for people. He wants to change the flavor of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with him, obviously, on that position. One of the things that troubles me about the immigration issue is, whatever your view on it is, this idea that we, little old Rhode Island, are going to speak truth to power and basically taunt the president into coming after us is incredibly foolhardy. Because if you are President Trump and you are serious about enforcing all the things you said you want to do about immigration in your campaign, and you want to pick a target, aren't we the ultimate target to pick? I mean, really make an example of the rest of the country. It's very, very dangerous what the governor and the mayor are doing. Hmm. The target being what? Withdrawal of federal funds? Withdrawal of federal funds. Uh, you know what? I'm not so sure. Not unlike the travel ban. You know, the concept's interesting. and the, the, the logistics and the process are important. He got stopped at the, at, at the appellate court, well, the district court and the appellate court for a reason. Uh, there is no legal precedent for pulling funds back on, on, on a policy like there this. There may or may not be. All I'm saying is if you want to try it. You're not going to try it on California. And frankly, you can be opposed to the president without taunting him, basically begging him to come after you, which is what I see. When you stand up there and you say, bring it on, essentially, which is what the mayor is doing, I don't think that's good public policy. Well, Even if you agree with the, with the mayor's policy, which I don't, but it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, I got you. It's not your elected purview, but you were a citizen. What's your reaction to the Flynn thing? Um, well, I know much more, not much more about it than you do. Um, it does strike me that he resigned because of, apparently he lied to the vice president. That's what I'm hearing. Right. As you point out, the Logan Act has probably been violated by every administration right. going back. It doesn't make it right, but that's not the reason why he resigned. Right. I think it became a political liability. He resigned. And Donald Trump does not seem like the kind of guy that's going to let things linger for better or for worse. So. Although it seems like it lingered for a good three or four weeks. And if he's more worried about leaks than he is about the actual act and yeah. hanging out as vice president, <sighs> Priorities are interesting. All right, we're going to talk to Brian about things going on here at home. But first, I want to remind you that Card Valet is a brand new program for Navigant Credit Union. It's a, a wonderful program. Uh, not only does it make your smartphone smarter, it lets you really do a lot of intimate banking well past what online banking generally provides. So everything you do with that card is noted on your phone today, yesterday, the month before, the year before almost tomorrow. It really is fascinating. Um, it's great technology and you want to have it. And if you don't have it, get it. And if you don't have a relationship with Navigant Credit Union, join, become a member. They've been making life's journey wonderful for members since, uh, well, over a hundred years ago. Uh, insured by the NCUA, Navigant Credit Union. Back with the state rep coming up. Stay with us. I'm not saying I'm going to do it next year or three years or five years. I'm saying in this budget, as difficult as it is. Beginning July 1. Beginning July 1. The budget Affecting that the what, half a year of the car tax for people who are taxed on an annualized basis. And most people are actually taxed on a fiscal basis from their, from their communities anyway. We'll figure out how to do that. But okay. if, if the, the, the tax boards have to send back refund checks, I think that's a good problem that I'd, I'd like to see occur. Uh, Speaker Mattiello on my radio program on WPRO eight days three till six um, uh, about a week or two ago, talking about the car tax. Uh, some interesting stuff going on here with the uh, the Speaker's car tax plan, the Governor's car tax plan. The Speaker wants to eliminate the car tax over five years, which will cost forty million dollars in the state budget of reprioritization, right? And then eighty, and then one twenty, and then one uh, as it goes, one sixty and two hundred. The governor just tried to go tit for tat, seems to me, and said, "Okay, we'll take thirty percent off the vehicle value." Where are the Republicans going to be on this? Uh, on the specifics, I can't. I, don't, I no longer speak for just the Republicans. Speaking mm -hmm. for myself, right. I like the Speaker's plan. I haven't looked at every detail of it, but since we advocated repealing the car tax for years, I'm glad to see him adopt that policy. And uh, you know, I know there's arguments about whether it's the best way to do economic development, et cetera. But to me, it's always been a matter of fairness. Yeah, I, I you know, I think you got to look past. The, the car tax in a vacuum. So when you guys are evaluating that, I would hope that you do that because it's going to create a, a very strange imbalance on the property tax level and overall tax fairness. And this is not a progressive point of view. This is a tax equity point of view. 
uh, it's got to be calculated. Remember that Proposition Two and a Half and the big reform in Massachusetts, including their reform of the car tax, uh, they weren't done independently of each other. Yep. And I just think it's going to be very, very. I don't think I don't think the look. Republican politics forced the day. Steve Frias' race to the wire with Speaker Mattiello caused this car tax commitment. Uh, great. Steve Frias is kind of like the MVP. But the Speaker, I still has I don't think he's completely done his homework on this. Well, I would agree that you can't look at any tax policy in a vacuum. If you're going to do something like this, you have to see how it's going to re, you know, have repercussions across the budget. There's no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean you don't do it. it otherwise, you get paralysis by analysis. You can have that, too. Sometimes you just got to move forward and do something. One of the big issues of the car tax beyond the money is it engenders disrespect for the law. I'm talking about people register their cars out of state. People get upset because they're paying a tax on basically a rust bucket. They know it's not worth it. It just it gen engenders a lot of disrespect. It's got to be gotten rid of. What's more important, re removing the car tax or, or making it equal for everybody who owns a car in the state of Rhode Island? Removing it because people evade it. It's one of the biggest, I mean, you drive around on the east side of Providence. I mean, I was talking to some, you know, some of your colleagues in the media, you live on the east side of Providence. I spent a lot of time there. My church is over there. You see cars over there with Florida plates in February? I mean, come on. <laughs> They're not in Florida. I mean, you know, it's, people evade all the time. I remember someone in my town who used to drive around in South Dakota plate for years. Yeah, come on. All right, uh, well, uh, a lot of analysis coming on that. We have a, a short uh, clip of uh, the governor talking about her Two-year free education program? I think we do. I don't think it's for long. Have the money. We just have to decide, are we up for it? And I think we are. Yeah. And, of course, we have a headline about Democrats who, who find themselves also divided over this free tuition concept, uh, an NPR headline, I think, uh, that came from uh, Ian Donis' work. Um, she wants CCRI to be free as long as you're on time and on budget. Uh, so to speak, with your with your your credits, and she wants junior and senior year at Rick and URI to be free. Before I start making speeches about it, what's your thought? Uh, I think it's a terrible idea. Look, college is overpriced. I have one child in college, one in high school, and one in middle school. Nobody understands it better than I do. College is overpriced all across the country. We need to do something about that. The way to do that is not to start subsidizing it more, because that's just driving the costs up. I sat around not long after this proposal came out at the State House with maybe six or seven fellow reps across the ideological spectrum. And I, I can confidently say that none of us thought this was a good idea. We all had differing ideas about what we ought to do. Yeah, she got, she yeah. got, she got what, her, her token round of applause uh, at the uh, State of the State uh, for this? It was pretty tepid. Uh, hmm. Applause. You were you were there. Yes. We talked about it. Hmm. Um, it was not the biggest applause line I've ever seen. I saw a lot of them fall flat. People see it as a, as pandering, which I think some of it is. We'd like to do things to help people go to college. You deserve to go to college. You'd like to go to college. You can't afford it. But just subsidizing it, giving people essentially free money. You know, the speaker said it best at the chamber uh, chamber lunch that that headline came from. Sometimes hmm. if you call something free, even though we all know it's not free, you devalue it. What we really need to do is understand why it is that URI costs as much as it does, for example, for in-state students. I, How do we bring that cost down? To be honest with you, listen, I've been bullish on URI and Rick as terrific educational institutions and really uh, cost-effective. I mean, my kid goes there, and I've never complained about the tuition. I mean, I don't like to write that check. Right. Um, uh, and I'm not getting any help on the FAFSA, I can promise you. Yeah. But uh, No, I, I agree. It, 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 but they're still more expensive than they need to be. Why is that? Well, you know, I don't know what that need, what that means. Need it more expensive than it needs to be. I mean, we only send nine percent of its of, of the URI budget from the state tax uh, coffers anyway. Um, they're an up and coming institution, have been for a long time. You know, record beating on X number of levels in curriculum. So, I don't know. I I, I just see it. my 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 thing is, you know, you want to put thirty million dollars into the institutions for a reason. Let's discuss what and how is the best use of thirty million dollars, right? Beef up teaching and research and cut overhead. Uh, that's oversimplified, but that's really the problem with college education in this country. Beef up teaching and research and cut overhead. Go back to what colleges used to be 40 or 50 years ago. The administration levels at colleges all across the country have exploded. You can look at data on that. Hmm. Well, if Dr. Dooley wants to come in on, and talk about that, we'll have to talk to him about, about the overhead. Do you have an instinct as to what overhead problems you or I would have? I just know that I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and I remember I graduated over 20 years ago, and I saw a uh, study about the administrative increase between 1980 at the time. It was 1996. I was graduating law school. It was incredible the number of administrators that have been added to the university payroll. I can only imagine what it's been like in the last 20 years. Then you wonder why the tuition is three and a half times what it was when I graduated, and I thought it was expensive back then. Hmm. Uh, you think that tuition proposal is DOA? I think it's DOA in the House, yes. Yeah, the Speaker don't want it. No, that's why I think it's DOA. But, yeah. you know, the Speaker doesn't want it, but I, I, I can't find anybody else in the House that does yet. I'm not saying they're not there, but the people I haven't talked to want it. They may want something different than what I want, but they don't want this. All right, when we come back, there's that RoadWorks program that's still lingering. 
and a big issue. Stay with us. So, roads and bridges, we've got to keep them safe. But well, we got a truck toll issue that is percolating, and we have the governor who has already admitted to me that uh, the State Department of Transportation uh, will be sitting on a maximum of a couple, three gantries uh, under this roadworks proposal, which is scheduled for 14 to 17, minimally, and could be more, uh, unless and until they get a verdict on litigation from the American Trucking Association, which is expected when the gantries go up. She says, uh, you know, that she's going to wait to put the entire $40 million infrastructure up before that case is litigated. The speaker told me last week that if they lose that case, they got to go back to square one. Oh, yeah. um, that's reassuring that the speaker thinks that because he's the one who kind of harnessed the plan and made it his own. He did, but talking about the court case, I mean, I, I don't want to prejudge any litigation, but I, I know enough about constitutional law to know there's not an unreasonable challenge there. What a court will do with it, I have no idea. And the real point is it won't just end in the district court level, it'll go up to the appellate court, and it'll probably go higher, possibly higher than that, because this is a test case of the trucking industry. If this happens in Rhode Island, they, want to see it, they don't want to see it across the country. The ultimate result, we're not going to know for years. Even fast track federal litigation doesn't move that fast. Right. So what is this notion that this whole sucker is going to, that, that it's in her 2018 fiscal budget, which begins June, July 1st, she's got, she's got that plan in the budget. That, that seems wow. almost specious in nature, given the, the practical projection of where the litigation's going to go. Of course, by not putting it in the budget, she'd be admitting a failure. So what's she supposed to do with that? I mean, you're right. But at some level, if she doesn't put it in her well, budget. Well, parentheses, yeah. we'll see, you yeah. know, based on what's going on there. Uh, that was, in, in my mind, in many ways, a, a, a shoot first, aim later type of approach, don't you think? Well, yeah, that's the General Assembly's MO, isn't it? I mean, that's what we do, right? <laughs> I mean, in my ten, nine years there, that's what we do more often than not. The only time we didn't do something that was shoot first, aim later was the pension reform. I mean, really, I'm trying to think of all the things we've done. Remember the time that we, we passed a budget? And I say we, I didn't vote for it. We passed a budget that at the last minute completely changed the uh, Board of Education uh, structure, just mm -hmm. blew it up. And then we had to come back six months later, eight months later, and revamp it. Like the second day back in session, back in January, we had to say, oh, I mean, that's the MO. That's, that's a problem with government in Rhode Island. Marijuana legislation? Um, I mean, you know, I support it, but I don't know what's going to happen with it. In inevitably, though, right? I would think so. I think it's all, it has to. If Massachusetts truly legalizes it, how do you keep it out of Rhode Island? I mean, it's like prohibition of alcohol. You can't, you can't do it. Uh, so you may as well harness it. So answer the question in short fashion. You're doing a great job. Republicans... This legislative session will have what kind of impact? In short fashion, it's hard to say because a lot of what goes on at the State House is behind the scenes. I mean, here's an interesting question for you. To what extent are the progressive left going to try to hold up the Speaker's budget? Will he have to come to us for support? If he does, we could have much more of an impact. Depends on how much he wants to uh, work with his left and how much he wants to work with us. Hmm. So we'll see. To be determined. Brian, thank you. Uh, final word and we can back. Stay with us. That which is going on in Washington, literally as we were taping the show, uh, Lexi tells me that Sean Spicer, press secretary, now says that, Trump, that the President Trump fired Michael Flynn. He didn't resign. Well, he told him to resign. It's terminating the relationship. Uh, we'll have to dig into the semantics, and I'm sure we will over the course of the week. By the way, at 7.30, this could be a save. It's Valentine's Day. <coughs> at midnight, you either remembered or you didn't. Good luck with that. See you tomorrow on the radio two or three.